Welcome to this edition of Labor Vision. I'm Bob Delaney, Executive Director of the Institute for Labor Studies and Research. Labor Vision, a production of the Institute, focuses on topics of importance to working Rhode Island families. We hope you enjoy this evening's edition. Finally passed the bill, it just felt like a weight just fell off his shoulders. We can go back tomorrow, pick up where we left off, but kind of uh, having a brighter step, a little bit more pep in our step. The biggest motivation for me is to keep teachers in West Virginia. There's a shortage of math and science, and all of our students deserve highly qualified teachers. It's, it's just amazing to see the, the, the spirit out there and the, the unity between all of the cows. This is my first year being a teacher and I have held hands with teachers that taught me and it's just been great. I've never witnessed anything like it. It has been a roller coaster ride. We have been very hopeful at times that things were getting ready to be passed and then it's like the rug gets jerked out from underneath us. They're discussing unfreezing PIA. It was just an amazing knowing that the nation was watching, knowing that people were inspired when part of the time we were just hanging on by a thread and trying to say, how do we get through the next hour? West and Randy Weingarten, it's amazing to have that a national president come all the way down here uh, to stand with us in the picket lines. After experiencing these past eight days, I really truly understood what the union is for and what it represents. How the union membership will be even stronger than it was before. West Virginia first, Oklahoma We're already starting to see that other states are starting to follow Oklahoma. Christine, I'm signing yours right now. Don't you throw nothing. It's been emotional for me today. I think it's going to be even more emotional to really look at what we just did here as a state. Good evening and welcome to this edition of Labor Vision. My name is Jim Riley. I'll be your host tonight. My guest is my old friend Frank Flynn, the president of the Rhode Island Federation of Teachers and Health Professionals. Frank, our viewers just saw about a two minute video about what's going on, a very topical uh, issue right now, the teachers in West Virginia. And you know, I'm, a, I'm a student of labor. I belong to the Rhode Island Labor History Society. I'm interested in labor history. And West Virginia is home to some of the greatest labor strikes in US history. The Great Railroad Strike of 1877, the Great Coal Strike of 1902, the Battle of Blair Mountain in 1921, and the Black Lung Strike of 1969, just to name a few. Now, we haven't heard a lot from uh, West Virginia with la regarding labor activism in recent years. Matter of fact, they even uh, went right to work in 2016. But just days ago, the governor of West Virginia publicly signed a contract raising the pay of West Virginia classroom teachers by 5% after a nine-day statewide strike. Frank, thanks to those brave teachers, the long dormant tradition of labor activism in West Virginia has been boldly reignited and the dominoes continue to fall. Yesterday, tens of thousands of West Virginia's brothers and sisters walked off their jobs in Kentucky and Oklahoma. Frank, I'm going to take a line from Carol King. I feel the earth move under my feet. What is going on in West Virginia? It's a great question, Jim. Um, we know that back starting in 2008 and maybe even before these austerity budgets that have been passed since then in many of our states but particularly our right to work states 
like West Virginia, who had, as you mentioned, a long labor history, particularly in the private sector labor uh, movement. Uh, the you know, United Mine Workers uh, uh, were, were very strong there in every aspect of their government. Uh, but since then, these austerity budgets have crippled our public schools. Uh, West Virginia is a very, has many areas of poverty, a uh, huge opioid addiction problem there, and uh, it's, it's very difficult to uh, hire and retain teachers there. Um, finally, the teachers have had enough. They, they can't get qualified teachers. The ones that do work there work in, in substandard conditions there. They, they feel impoverished, and it's, it's unprecedented that they would have 55 counties voting unanimously to go out on strike and, and shut down the entire state. Uh, uh, every school in the state, every, there are 680 schools in the state of West Virginia, every single one of them closed. Um, the government actually made a move knowing that, every, that, that there was a statewide walkout, everyone walked out. It wasn't an easy process. Um, they, uh, during the walkout, uh, the governor supported finding a way to fund uh, the schools more. Uh, the, uh, the, the House of Representatives in West Virginia uh, agreed to a 5% increase, and then the Senate balked on it, uh, mm -hmm. which uh, shut down that process and, and forced people out onto the street. So um, it, it, was, it was, as you said, unprecedented. Um, it was uh, built on years of, of people <clears throat> feeling that they were underappreciated, underpaid. Uh, many teachers had to work uh, extra jobs. They couldn't, uh, they were barely uh, making above uh, minimum wage. The other thing that really complicated this whole health care, this whole uh, labor strife in West Virginia was that the cost of their health care, they're in a state provided plan that all public employees in the state are members of, and the, the premium rates. Uh, could continue to rise exorbitantly and dug into their already low wages. So people now, not only weren't they getting increases in salaries, but they were bringing home less money every month and trying to make ends meet. And it was just a, a very difficult situation that forced people to take dramatic action, which um, was just uh, you know, unprecedented, as you said. From what I understand, in West Virginia, back to West Virginia we go, uh, they had a deal but they weren't happy with it and they walked out. We've characterized it as, as a teacher strike, but they, they went out on strike not only for the teachers themselves, but for all the public employees that work in the district because they're all impoverished. The support teachers, the teacher assistants, the custodians, the secretaries, the whole uh, community was working on, in, for impoverished wages. So, um, so it was a strike, and it was a strike for the students because the students needed teachers to be in the classroom. They needed to hire and retain appropriately certified teachers because they couldn't keep teachers because, as you said, teachers were going to neighboring communities to make uh, significantly more starting wage than some of the teachers were making after, after having taught in West Virginia schools for a number of years. I saw a student last night on the national news holding a textbook, a school textbook, with no spine on the book being held together with duct tape. Tape. So they're neglecting the school budget, uh, budgets for all this time, trying to keep tax, taxes lower by not spending money on kids' education. We all know how important it is. That's our future, the kids', the kids education. Do you think this is leading to a movement? I understand that yesterday, tens of thousands of teachers in Kentucky and Oklahoma walked off their jobs. And I did see uh, one, uh, one of the heads of the union in Oklahoma say, yeah, we're, we're, we're getting a deal, but we're not taking it because they're not talking about the janitors, they're not talking about the secretaries, support staff, and uh, the, the folks that work in uh, providing food for these individuals. I, I really think this is the beginning of a movement here. It, it's a huge movement, and one thing you have to consider is uh, outside of uh, Charleston, West Virginia, it's mostly rural communities. And the people that teach there, they work in the schools, they, their children go to schools in, those, in the same communities. They are, go to the same churches and civic organizations with all of the members of the community. So 
they all know one another. And, and this is a movement that's really, it's a grassroots movement that everyone in the community is rallying around these schools because they know that the teachers are there to provide an education for their kids and they can't do it without the appropriate resources. And the, the, the state of West Virginia largely funds their schools. It's not like they have a, local, a lot of local property tax revenue that's able to do that because of the rural nature of, of most of West Virginia. So they needed to get those teachers, uh, those community groups and church groups in, engaged so that they could get the support they needed to be successful in this. And one of the things they also did that in, in preparing for this, they knew that many of these kids, over two thirds of the kids in West Virginia are on free and reduced lunch. Ah. So they knew that if they were out for any prolonged period of time, they need to have alternative places for those kids to go and get food. So they worked with the local churches and state and local food banks to make sure that these kids didn't go without food and provide because that's the nature of the community relationship. And that is so important if you're going to be successful and get you know, the, pub, the court of public opinion on your side. Uh, we've had good, strong unions here in Rhode Island uh, for uh, teachers uh, for many years now. And um, we've got, so we've gotten West Virginia, Kentucky, Oklahoma. I, I, I mean, I think you'll agree with me, this is going to keep moving. There's no doubt about it. It almost kind of reminds me of, the, of this movement that these kids uh, from Parkland High School, uh, what, what they've started has become a movement. I really believe that this is going to be, uh, also be just as big and just as heavy a movement. And now, while, while we've got pretty good wages and benefits and working conditions here in Rhode Island, how do we make legislators uh, in Rhode Island see that education is the top priority for our future? Well, I think that we do have a, a, a good funding formula in Rhode Island. Uh, the General Assembly has continued, and the governor have continued uh, year after year to continue to fund schools. Um, there is always a need to do more things. Right now, our top priority is is a bond issue that uh, we're hoping to get before the, the uh, electorate next fall, get it through the General Assembly this session, and getting the legislators on board to fix our schools. We, you know, we've got schools that are over 60 years old, the average age is over 60 years old. Mm -hmm. um, we need to want, we want to send our kids to warm, safe, dry, state-of-the-art schools where they can get the best possible education and it takes money to, to uh, bring the schools up to that condition and we're hoping that the General Assembly gets behind that initiative. I, I see with the Fixer Schools Now Coalition largely supported and begun uh, uh, by a, a, a collection of, of labor unions. Great coalition, and um, it's it's become now uh, uh, Lisa Nelson, who who's kind of running the Fix Our School Now coalition, and is also involved even more deeply in this because she's got a really good handle on it. Uh, is is really moving to uh, get this kind of work done. Now, this is all, not only just for the, for the students and, and the school teachers, but also for the building trades that are going to build these schools that are and repair these schools. So this this is a, a big win all around. I'm excited about what's going on. I'm excited about what you guys are doing. And uh, thanks for coming here to Labor Vision. This is very topical. It's going on right now. We appreciate you coming aboard. Thank you, Jim. Anytime. That's it for Labor Vision tonight. Thank you for watching. Good evening and welcome to this edition of Labor Vision. My name's Jim Riley. I'll be your host this evening. I've got two fabulous guests today. We've got Dr. Scott Malloy from the Schmidt Labor Research Center in, in, uh, at URI, and also, incidentally, the Grand Marshal of the 2018 Providence St. Patrick's Day Parade. Congratulations. Yeah, thank you. Fabulous. And our second guest is professional gadfly and troublemaker, Pat Crowley, Assistant Executive uh, Director at NEARI. Gentlemen, welcome. It's great to have you here. We've got Thanks, a good Jim. subject today. Happy to have you. We're going to talk about the Irish contribution to the Rhode Island labor movement today. So let's start at the beginning. A lot of people think that uh, uh, the, Irish, the Irish Catholics came here after the Great Hunger in the mid-1800s. But there were a lot, of, a lot of Irish here long before that, weren't there? Yeah, the Irish started to arrive on uh, Rhode Island shores really the beginning part of the 1800s. Uh, everyone is aware of the Great Potato Famine in the middle part of the century, but there was several other famines before. There was one in 1808, another in 1822, and 
based upon those hardships they were facing over in the old country, they started to show up in Rhode Island and everywhere on the East Coast. Um, they were the largest immigrant group to Rhode Island for a number of years, well into the 1860s. Mm -hmm. You want to add something? Well, I would say uh, that that earlier generation that preceded those from the Great Hunger in the 1820s and 1830s were very fortunate in one respect. Uh, there was a lot of infrastructure uh, improvements going on in America at that time. So uh, in Rhode Island, for example, they built Fort Adams, a uh, almost a lifetime project because it took so long. Uh, they built America's first shopping uh, center, the Arcade, still in downtown Providence and still beautiful as ever. And they also dug their way from Canal Street in Providence to Woonsocket and then on to Worcester as they put together the Blackstone uh, Canal, uh, which took 15 years and uh, Pretty much your life was using a shovel and having a stiff back. Yeah, having yeah. a stiff back. You know, that reminds me, my father, Jack Riley, uh, was in a CCC camp uh, back in the late 30s and uh, uh, worked uh, up in uh, Maine and New Hampshire, uh, just chopping down trees to make roads and uh, said it was one of the greatest experiences of his <laughs> life. And he had a broad back, too. Uh, so it was after the famine and mass migrations that things started getting kind of difficult for the uh, Irish uh, in Rhode Island. They, they maybe have or e more easily sim sim assimilated uh, early on, but seem to have some more problems. Irish need to apply that sort of thing later on. Can you talk about that, please? Well, sure. Well, in Rhode Island in particular, there was still a property requirement to vote for most offices up until 1870. And for municipal offices, the, we didn't change the property requirement for naturalized immigrants until 1928. So for decades after they first arrived, there was cons Rhode Island constitutional bars against, against people from other countries, but primarily aimed at the Irish Catholic immigrants uh, to bar them from taking part in political uh, organizing on their own. So they really had to look at other ways to defend themselves as a people and as immigrants. Not very different from what was happening in Ireland at the time. That's right. I mean, a lot of the problems that they faced from the British oppressors, they found very similar circumstances here. Mm -hmm. Luckily, they formed strong enough communities where they could start to protect themselves and find ways to make sure their families were fed. Mm -hmm. They went basically from a British aristocracy to a Yankee aristocracy ah. right here mm -hmm. uh, in Rhode Island. And unfortunately for them, unlike the earlier generation, uh, most of those jobs had dried up. Uh, America and Rhode Island was in the middle of a recession in the 1850s when most of the famine refugees uh, arrived. And because there were so many of them, there was already a built-in animosity among the English settlers going back a couple of hundred years against the Irish. So all of a sudden you have tens of thousands of poor Irish Catholics showing up not only in Rhode Island but around the country. This only exacerbated and made it worse uh, for them because they were basically poor, uh, they were sickly, uh, they had a lot of uh, social problems and because of that the Yankees reacted uh, in the most insipid uh, fashion. Yeah, but they weren't going anywhere. That's right. So what did the typical Irish family or clan or group do to overcome this uh, discrimination and mistreatment? Well, there's a great <clears throat> book that one of the professors at URI currently, uh, Eve Stern, wrote about the Irish and immigrant experience. The book's called Ballots and Bibles. Yeah, terrific book. I'm yeah, familiar with and it. Well, one of the ways that uh, Dr. Stern talks about what the Irish did was they used the local parish system to create their own conditions to not only you know, worship as they chose to see, but also to develop a community base for their mutual protection. They used the parish hall, they used the parish priest as conduits to a larger society so that they could not only protect themselves, but learn the ways of American democracy. As Scott said, these were peasant people coming from an imperial system with no experience in a representative democracy. They literally had to learn what it meant to you know, debate, engage in politics, and learn the nuts and bolts of Americanism. Hmm. And, and one thing too, uh, when the Irish uh, in Ireland, at least for many decades, the one thing they did do uh, was speak out. And they developed a certain skill 
uh, known for their oratory and great public uh, speaking. When they got to America, even though they had no industrial experience because the British, just like in the American Revolution, forbade uh, any industrial activity so as not to compete with the mother country. And uh, what, what they did here was use that political acumen, that ability to uh, uh, speak in a public fashion, not only for politics, uh, but in particular for the labor movement. And so once the Irish got involved with that, uh, they rose very quickly to the top into leadership positions, particularly by the 1880s with the uh, Knights of Labor. Mm -hmm. Speaking of great orators, I don't know anybody who likes to follow you on a speaking program. <laughs> <laughs> but the Scots, right, the, the Irish role in the Knights of Labor was particularly strong in Rhode Island. Their Grand Marshal workmen uh, had names like Patrick Quinn, who was a, you know, one of our contemporaries is also Patrick Quinn mm -hmm. in SEIU. He was yeah. one of their leaders in Rhode Island. But um, Terence Powderly, the national leader of the Knights of Labor, had a lot of roles in the early Rhode Island labor movement and set the stage for what would later become the AFL, the American Federation of Labor, which is part of the AFL-CIO that most people know of today. A lot of that work was done by Irish-American leaders and based a lot in Rhode Island. Mm -hmm. you, you may have touched on this to some degree, but why do you think it was so easy for the Irish to organize into politics? here in Rhode Island? Well, in those days, uh, most ethnic groups uh, stayed to themselves. Uh, they lived in basically colonies uh, within the city. Every ethnic group had their own little uh, neighborhood. And I think because of that, there was a tremendous feeling of uh, solidarity uh, at home and uh, at work. And so when you get to the Knights of Labor, they hold a, a big rally at Rocky Point on Labor Day in 1882. And uh, at the end of the festivities, tens of thousands of people there, mm -hmm. it's, it's uh, terminated with three cheers for Ireland and thousands of people yelling and uh, screaming. So it really gives you a sense of how uh, uh, Irish Catholic uh, that movement was. I've seen pictures of the uh, St. Patrick's Day celebrations uh, back in, uh, in the 1850s, 1860s, uh, after the Civil War uh, in Rhode Island. Tens of thousands of people, absolutely incredible, the crowds that they, that they would draw. And it's interesting, too, Jimmy, that the, uh, I mean, it wasn't just the Irish. They turned out on St. Patrick's Day because this was their Easter parade, so to speak. Yeah. They wanted to look good. But you'd also see the French turn out on uh, St. Jean-Baptiste Day or the Italians on Columbus Day. Uh, every ethnic group had their own holiday, mm -hmm. and they always wanted to be dressed and look as good as they could in order to show off and, and to uh, let people know that they had uh, made it. They were, they were climbing that ladder of success. Mm -hmm. Like myself, you're an, an organizer. Um, so, Patrick, why do you think, once again, I'm going to ask you the same question, why do you think it was so easy for the Irish to organize? Well, I think it, it is important to point out that one advantage that the Irish had over other immigrant groups was that they spoke the language that the dominant class did. Mm -hmm. So even if they weren't accepted into the circles that the elites ran in, they could still communicate with each other in the language of the, of the politics of the day. And I don't think that is it's something that can really be discounted because having that ability to communicate meant that you could follow the news. And if you could follow the news, you could find out what the bosses were doing to you. And you could say, this isn't right. What are we going to do about it? So having that advantage was critical to the Irish success. And like Scott said, being able to communicate not just uh, to each other, but using the English language to communicate to a broader community let them to organize and really, once the franchise was established for everyone, enter into the political realm. And we've had some great Irish political leaders in the state, including some labor folks that uh, I know Scott's very interested in. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and I would inject just a little bit of humor there. Uh, there's a great story, whether it was real or apocryphal, I don't know, uh, but two uh, Irishmen having a conversation at Fox Point where they were kind of quarantined, <laughs> and a couple of Englishmen uh, kind of listening to them. And one Englishman says to the other, um, what language are they speaking? And the other, English, the other Englishman would say, I am at the faintest idea. Even though they were both speaking English, it was with a brogue. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And so it might as well have been another language to other people, but exactly. certainly not to the Irish. 
Uh, immigration is still a big issue today. Not so much Irish immigration, but immigration from individuals from other countries, from third world countries. We have a president of the United States who doesn't like these people and doesn't want them here. Um, why do you think about the plight of Irish? It, can, can, can what we've done be duplicated with the waves of new immigrants today? I think so. I mean, I think what's important to know is that how the Irish are treated is very similar to how people from Latin America and other third world countries are being treated today. And I think it's important for people of Irish descent in particular to know that, that the way that Donald Trump talks about people coming in from Mexico and Central America is the same way the Providence Journal talked about us landing on the boats. You know, we didn't come in caravans, we came in ships. But the same fear mongering that we faced people are facing today, and I think it's important that we don't pull the ladder up behind us and try to build that wall. Hmm. I, I, there's actually a story in the news today about a so-called caravan coming up from Honduras with individuals, and they're actually tracking it. Uh, the, the Republicans are tracking this caravan because caravan, right. they don't want these, these individuals to come to this country. That's how crazy it is. It's the, sa uh, it's the same story, you know, a hundred years later, and I think it's important for us that care about oppression and fighting back against power structures to understand that it's the same story just with different characters, and we've got to do our best as organizers to make sure that the fight for justice continues. Mm -hmm. I can also provide you with a hundred citations in the want ads of the Providence Journal. Uh, in the Gilded Age, 1880s, 1890s, where they'll be looking for help, men or women, and at the bottom, after every other ethnic group, they'll say, no Irish need apply. This isn't something we made up or thought that would sound good. We've got the physical evidence to prove it. And so if we were treated like that, uh, mistreated like that, uh, it should give us an extra added incentive to realize that the way our great-grandparents were pushed around the greatest way to honor their sacrifice and contribution to our good way of life today is to reach our hand out to these newcomers and say, welcome aboard, we were in your shoes once, and we're going to help you along. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, it's important for us to understand, and that's why the struggle for Irish freedom that's gone on you know, up through today is the same struggle. It's a worldwide struggle to make sure that oppressed people you know, are treated with dignity and respect. Absolutely. This has been a terrific conversation. I'm so happy that you guys came by today. And that's it for this edition of Labor Vision. We'll see you next time. Thank you for joining us for this edition of Labor Vision. We appreciate your input and encourage your comments. Labor Vision can be seen on this channel three times each week, Tuesday at 7 p.m., Thursday at 8 p.m., and Saturday at 5 p.m.